afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. After the first talks of, this ta uh, of the day, we have learned a lot of broken things. And now we have a talk with a title promising to do something better, improving the security of session management in web applications. Yeah, Philip is from the University of Leuven and um, is part of a research group and I think Philip will introduce himself and his group. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Philip from the University of Leuven, as he said. I'm part of the Disneynet Research Group and I'm a PhD student I'm currently in my uh, fourth year, so I'm uh, nearing the end. And my research is focused uh, on several things, and one of these is uh, web application security and more specifically session management. So, um, as you probably all know, uh, session management is used in web applications to tie multiple requests together because HTTP is basically a stateless protocol, which means that as a server, there's no real way to tie uh, multiple requests together. So if you receive two requests, you don't know whether they belong for, to the same user, whether they come from different, uh, different machines. So um, basically, they invented a mechanism called session management, which uh, allows you to tie them together as a single session. It also allows you to store data at a server, so you can uh, keep some information in the session, like the authentication status. Is user authenticated? Who is this user? And uh, sessions are typically identified um, by uh, some kind of token, a session identifier. So uh, this session identifier is included in every request. So you probably all know the session cookies. Uh, it can also be as a parameter in the request. And um, it allows the server to look up the, the correct state. Important here is that this session identifier is actually a bearer token, and that means that the one who presents the token is assumed to be in control of, of that uh, token and the, the accompanying session. So, um, two examples. Uh, the first one is, is very well known, or should be very well known. It's basically a session cookie, um, which is set by the server, which contains some unique uh, random value, and is sent by the browser on every request to the same domain. So whenever a server receives that request, he knows, okay, this belongs to the, that session with this, this in this state, so I can process it accordingly. As a fallback mechanism, um, it can also be done as a parameter. So uh, basically you have a URL, and in the URL you have a parameter with the session ID uh, embedded. This means that the application would have to rewrite every URL. Uh, it also means that it can easily leak, for instance, in the referrer header. It can uh, leak out. It can uh, be stored in log files, uh, things like that. So um, it's not a preferred mechanism, but a lot of applications and frameworks still support it as a fallback in case cookies are not accepted. So uh, it's important to consider. The problem here is that these things are actually flawed by design. And uh, it's mainly the bearer token that forms the problem. So um, it works fine as long as you assume that the token cannot leave uh, the, the, the browser or the server. But once an attacker con gets control of the bearer token, he also controls the session. So um, because of the bearer token characteristics, once an attacker presents it to the server, the server just assumes, okay, this is uh, user Philip because the session belongs to him, so I'll process this request in his session and transfer some money from his account or send a mail in his name or whatever. Um, and especially with session identifiers, they are very popular. Uh, it's one of the most popular cross-site scripting attacks. It's, uh, these kind of attacks are also number two in OWASP top 10, so everything to do with broken authentication uh, session management. Uh, it's very prevalent, it's very dangerous, and um, there are numerous attacks uh, that specifically target this, this thing. So um, I'll illustrate two in the presentation here. We have uh, session hijacking and session fixation. I'll explain briefly uh, what they do and how they work. So in a session hijacking attack, um, an attacker basically will, will take over the, the user session. He will get full control. And um, this is especially problematic after authentication, because the user once authenticated and the session is transferred, then the attacker has access to a fully authenticated session. There are two very common attack vectors. Uh, one is from JavaScript, so by injecting a script uh, and extracting the session identifier, uh, the attacker gains control of the session. And the other one is by eavesdropping on the network. Um, common example here is FireSheep, which you probably heard of. If, in case you haven't, uh, you should look it up. It's a Firefox add-on that allows uh, any wireless network user just by pointing click to take over uh, Facebook sessions, uh, Google Plus sessions, anything that uh, is transmitted in the clear. So how does it work? Um, very schematically, you have a victim which will uh, connect to a target server and you have the attacker here. So basically what happens uh, with any web application, basically, you connect, um, you get some page uh, from the server which includes a session identifier, in this case, for instance, a cookie. Um, you authenticate to the application, you use the session identifier uh, to establish an authenticated session. 
Um, and then the attacker is able to steal your session identifier. For instance, he's on the same network, he sees it flying by in clear text, so uh, he just grabs it out of the air. You don't have a, even have a clue that that happened. Once the attacker now connects to the target application using the session identifier, he basically uh, is greeted with your session and he can do whatever you are allowed to do in your session. Second attack is session fixation, which is uh, lesser known than session hijacking, uh, but nonetheless uh, also very dangerous. And what you do here is actually you reverse the process and you um, will force the user to work with your uh, session as an attacker. So this can also be done uh, through JavaScript, uh, meta tag injection from a related domain if you have uh, multiple subsites, um, or even with, uh, by sending a simple URL to the user containing a session ID. So again, uh, schematically, how does it work? In this case, the attacker will first establish a session with the target application. So he just acts as a normal user, he gets a session with a session identifier, um, and he stores it in a the browser. Then he transfers this session identifier to the user's browsers, uh, browser. So um, it's a very simple example. If you have parameter-based session management, you send him uh, a mail with a link, like here's a funny video of a cat, uh, question mark, PIP session, a a session ID is one, two, three. The user clicks on this link, okay, uh, who wants to see cats? Everybody apparently on the internet. So um, he opens this, uh, this link sends the session identifier to the target application, which then uh, could ask the user to authenticate himself. Um, when this happens, it happens within this session, which is actually the attacker session. So um, the user successfully authenticates, uh, everything looks fine. But once the attacker detects the user has authenticated himself, he can take over the session once again. So um, this is uh, very similar to session hijacking, and in both cases, the attacker ends up with uh, an authenticated session uh, under the user's name. So what can we do to protect against this? Of course, these attacks have been known for quite a while. Um, there's extensive uh, research on it, and there are things you can do. Even OWASP, OWASP has, a, has a nice uh, document listing uh, most of them. First of all, general advice for session management, you need to choose strong, unique session identifiers. Uh, of course, if you don't, uh, an, an attacker can simply brute force it. Uh, there's no need for hijacking, fixation, or whatever. So um, if you have good, strong values, that's step one. The second step is to, to rotate them after you change your privileges in the application. So for instance, after an authentication, rotate the session identifier, switch it to something else. So in case the attacker already had it from before, for instance in a session fixation attack, uh, it's useless because it has changed after the authentication and you can no longer uh, access the authenticated session. Of course, if you have a session hijacking after authentication, you're uh, still vulnerable. And a third uh, piece of advice is to deploy your site over HTTPS. Um, this should um, take care of some eavesdropping attacks, but um, these on, on its, by themselves are not enough. So for cookie-based session management, there are some additional steps you have to take. Forget one of these and you still remain vulnerable to, to several session management attacks. First of all, uh, the HTTP only flag, which is probably uh, well known, should be enabled for session cookies because it basically prevents any JavaScript from reading or writing to these cookies. So. Um, this would prevent a cross-site scripting based session hijacking attack, for instance. You have the secure flag, which should be enabled on HTTPS sites because uh, it prevents the session cookie from being sent on an HTTP channel. Um, so if you don't do this and even your whole site is HTTPS, there are still attacks like uh, SSL stripping or things like that can be used uh, to obtain a session cookie. So um, also use that flag. And it's always um, useful to limit the lifetime of a session cookie. So uh, even if there might be some attack, uh, it's still limited in time and not valid like forever. So it seems like the problem is solved, but uh, unfortunately it isn't, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. So the problem with these cases is that, first of all, they're not deployed that often. So they have been around for a few years, HTTP only is even quite old. But even nowadays, sites don't deploy this. So they remain vulnerable for this kind of attacks. Um, while HTTP only is fairly easy to deploy, frameworks can enable it by default because a session identifier is basically useless in JavaScript. You don't need it there. So enable it by default and you offer some protection. Um, I think this year uh, the new Tomcat came out and they, they have it on by default now. So uh, things are starting to move, but uh, still globally on the internet, it's, uh, it's a very depressing situation. Same thing for secure. Um, if you have an HTTPS site, you should have uh, secure cookies, um, unless they're shared over HTTP, which is uh, problematic, but then you, you can also cannot use it because you need them on HTTP. A second thing is that the HTTPS deployments are fairly limited. If you look at 
any website on the internet, they typically protect um, protect the sensitive part, like the authentication process, because there are credentials there. We need to protect this. But then they switch right back to HTTP um, using the, the same session identifier over an HTTP channel, which is exactly the case that Firesheep is making. Like, don't do this. It's really problematic. Uh, with three clicks, uh, your session is stolen and taken over, but uh, websites keep doing it. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know why. Um, there are many reasons, probably, for uh, the lack of HTTPS deployment. Um, I can speculate about some of them. Um, maybe you know, you have an insight why your corporation doesn't do it or why you do it. Um, please come and tell me. I'm very interested to know. But um, some of the guesses I can make is developers generally don't know. Maybe it's uh, valid for the smaller websites. They don't care. It's also possible. Um, the whole certificate mess is too complex uh, or too expensive. It might be, might be a reason. Um, people with a lot of uh, boxes in between, like caches, uh, intrusion detection, load balancing, might find it too complicated or uh, impossible to have uh, SSL enabled because it, it interacts with these kind of services. Or some applications might just not need it. So if you have, uh, for instance, a, a blog which has all public information, you've outsourced your uh, authentication process to an identity provider like OpenID or Google or whatever, you're like, okay, I have no sensitive information. I don't need uh, SSL at all because what do I care? Um, unless, of course, uh, your session management remains vulnerable. And that's exactly what we see happening. So the problem we're trying to address um, in, in our work is you have HTTP applications which basically have no protection. They're just uh, out there in, on the web, plain text. Uh, anybody in the neighborhood of a user can uh, eavesdrop on the traffic. And if there is a vulnerability, you can easily take over the session. On the other hand, you have HTTPS applications, which are fairly secure. The HTTP only and secure attributes uh, on the cookies, combined with something like a strict transportation header, um, provides adequate protection. It's not perfect, but it's acceptable. So I would be really happy if all sides do this. But in between, you have like this huge gap where there's no real, real solution. So what we are trying to do is to improve the session management of HTTP applications so that they uh, gain the advantages offered by, by these, these attributes. So ideally, we would have HTTP applications with secure session management. And if they decide that they want further uh, security properties like entity authentication or confidentiality or integrity, the exact items offered by uh, HTTPS, then they can decide to upgrade to uh, the full HTTPS experience with all uh, security properties that are attached to it. But unfortunately, that's not the case today. And hopefully, um, we can make a difference in the, in the coming uh, years. So the example I will use to explain our technique um, has to do with third-party authentication. So I'm assuming an application like a blog, which has public information, which outsources its authentication to services like OpenID, Facebook, or Google, and actually doesn't really need HTTPS, but wants a secure session management. So um, it's actually. I think it's a good thing that you have these services because they're specialized in doing authentication. They provide two-factor, three-factor, whatever factor authentication. Um, they include mobile phones and whatever. So they actually give a good experience. And uh, by offering them to other websites, they, the websites are able to include uh, safe authentication processes without doing all the work themselves. So. Um, to illustrate how this uh, this would work very schematically, um, I have a brief uh, brief uh, sequence diagram. So you have the browser on the left, that's the user. You have the server, that's the application you want to provide, like the blog. And you have an open ID provider. So what you typically do is you go to the blog website as a user. Um, you send some requests. The blog website res responds, sets a cookie uh, for session management, um, which is stored in the browser. And it redirects you to the authentication provider, in this case, an open ID provider. You go there, uh, you get a login page, okay? Uh, login page is uh, fetched, and a cookie is set for the OpenID provider because it also needs session management. Uh, it's a different cookie, different service, so uh, fairly normal. Um, you authenticate as a user with credentials or whatever in this case. Um, it's opened up, up to the provider to, uh, to take care of this. You submit your cookie because it's uh, within your session, and you get back some uh, kind of authentication assertion or token or whatever, depending on the service. This thing is then sent to the to the server where you wanted to authenticate to, um, which can validate this token from the OpenID provider, saying, OK, this is signed by the provider. It looks good. And it says you're authenticated as uh, user Philip. So I will uh, link this to your account here. And you also, of course, send a cookie so it can uh, take care of session management where necessary. So um, 
I will now present our uh, improvement to session management and then I will revisit this example to show how this works. So what we propose is um, to provide secure session management um, with some additional properties. So what we want to ensure is that once you establish a session between two parties, that the session remains between those two parties. So it's not possible to uh, transfer it uh, to an attacker uh, computer, for instance, So uh, unless you give explicit permission, uh, which I won't go further into. So um, if we have this, if we have a session that's, uh, that remains between the initiators, you d effectively disable eavesdropping attacks and also in-application attacks like uh, cross-site scripting attack or um, something like that. Additionally, we would like this thing to work um, with uh, third-party authentication scenarios because there are solutions that do this, but they typically are incompatible with uh, third-party authentication scenarios, so um, they might not uh, be useful in, in the web which are sourced these things. So, on a high-level overview, what we do is we establish a shared secret. Um, we use a, a variant of the Diffie-Hellman uh, key establishment algorithm. I'm not going into the crypto details, you can find it in the paper if you want to. We introduce a new session header, which basically contains a session identifier, which can be publicly known, because um, it's useless without, without uh, the secret stored in the browser uh, used to generate signatures. So, um, what basically will happen is uh, the server will receive a request, uh, know the session, and then if, the, if he can verify the signature that belongs to that uh, user, uh, which is stored in the session, only then he accepts the request, otherwise he rejects it. And the secret is locked in the browser. It's uh, not accessible to any API. It's not uh, transmitted over the network. Um, so basically, um, it's unreachable to an attacker uh, unless he controls the user's machi user machine or things like that, which we consider out of scope. So uh, on a very high level, how does it work? You have a browser and you have a server here. So in the first request, you simply uh, connect, contact the application and you ask for some resource. You indicate that you support this new session management mechanism so that the server knows uh, it can, can use this instead of uh, the old cookie system or whatever. Server responds with the resource you requested and uh, gives you a session identifier. Um, then some hocus pocus happens to establish a shared secret, which I will uh, talk about in, in a moment. And once this is done, um, the browser can send a second request with this session identifier and some signature. Um, so the server can uh, verify this signature because they have a shared secret um, and see whether uh, this is actually a valid request or not. And if it is a valid request, it responds. If it isn't a valid request, uh, it can assume that an attacker is using this session identifier with a different shared secret because the signature doesn't match and it just uh, discards, the, discards the request. So, yeah. Okay, so the signature is based um, not on, well, it includes the session ID. Um, the exact parameters, um, we haven't defined them um, because it's, it's up to how, many, how much integrity you want. But what you need to include, um, it will be more clear on the next slide, but you need to include the session identifier and uh, some counter to prevent replay attacks. And you might even want to include the data uh, to prevent uh, manipulation attacks on the network level. So that was a high level overview. In a bit more detail uh, about establishing the shared secret, um, what actually happens in the beginning is the, the browser generates a key, K, and calculates uh, the, the HMAC for the first request and uh, sends it out. So at this moment, only the, the browser knows the key. Um, it sends the support header like I support sessions, here's some counter to prevent replay, and an HMAC of this first request. Um, the HMAC is uh, calculated using the key K, so um, it's based on the shared secret, which is not yet shared. The server, at this point, he cannot verify the signature because he doesn't have the key, but what he does is he stores this for later, uh, generates a new session identifier for the new session object, and generates a public part um, for the key exchange, uh, which is some detail about the cryptographic algorithm, but um, it's not important to know what it's for. Just uh, he generates it and he submits this public part to the client. This can be observed by an attacker on a network. It's uh, fine because it's one of the properties provided by the algorithm. So at this point, the client has um, his response and his session identifier. He calculates a second public part to send to the server, which will allow the server to calculate the key. Again, he HMAX uh, his request and sends it out. So what you have here is a session identifier, which is given by the server. You have the public part, which combined with this um, 
can be used by the server to uh, calculate this key, but not, not an attacker. And you have, again, a counter and an HMAC. So the server, at this point, verifies uh, whether this, this is correct. He calculates the key and now can uh, verify both HMACs. And if they, they actually match the request, then he is sure this is sent by the user. If um, one of these is a mismatch, then the attacker is trying to, to get in between and he can abort the whole situation. Once the key, well, well, once this checks out, he stores the key, and with this key he can uh, verify any future request which uh, has an HMAC based on the key. So he just responds, uh, server is, is done with his tasks except for verifying, and the client uh, in the future just sends uh, the session identifier, a counter, and an HMAC. So, as promised, I will apply this to the running example I introduced before. So, um, in the first request, to the server, the client indicates like, okay, I support this new session management mechanism, some counter, some HMAC. Um, he gets the redirect, he gets a session identifier between browser and server and some public value. Then he goes to the OpenID provider. He does not have a, a session, so he generates a new key, sends a new uh, support header, gets a new uh, identifier and a new public value. He submits his credentials in the next step. Um, where he submits the second public value, so the OpenID provider can now calculate his key for his session between the browser and himself. And um, if authentication is successful, he provides the client with the right assertion to relay to the, to the uh, target server. So here, uh, it's actually the same story. You have the session identifier from here, you have a public part that belongs to this public part, and this should be two, and you have an HMAC. Um, so basically, um, after this, you have uh, established an authenticated session using the assertion and the new session management technique. One important thing here, um, this transaction with, between the OpenID provider and the browser submits credentials, so you should do it over a secure channel. Um, it doesn't change, and it probably will never change in the whole history of the web. As long as you submit sensitive information, do it in a safe way. But this transaction between the browser and the server can happen over a plain text channel, so no, no longer uh, encryption is no longer needed, because there is no sensitive data that can leak out, and the shared secret is only stored in the browser and the server, so never transmitted, so mm. there's nothing to be stolen. Of course, um, you have to watch out that this assertion does not become a bearer token, because otherwise an attacker can still use it uh, to hijack or fixate sessions, but that's uh, something up to the specification of the the authentication provider. So OpenID uh, has specifically mentioned this, mentions this and takes care of it. If I remember correctly, all out uh, doesn't provide it, so um, it's one of the known vulnerabilities and something that needs to be addressed there. Okay, um, to deploy this, um, of course, it's it's a change to the web platform, so it's not easy to to deploy something like this. What do we need uh, to improve se uh, session management or the security of session management? We need the session header to be supported. At the server side, you could implement this as a session management mechanism in your framework. So for instance, in PHP, what you typically do is uh, you do session start, and then the session management mechanism kicks in, which is cookie-based. Um, here, well, you could replace it or augment it with uh, the session header. So uh, it's actually transparent to the application, but the framework takes care of it. At the browser side, um, things are a bit more difficult. You have to implement support for the session header, which you can do either directly, but then you need to convince Mozilla or Chrome to do it. You could do it as an extension for a select number of users, but the problem there is, um, since you have to sign parts of the HTTP request, uh, you need to be sure that you're in the end of the line uh, of extensions handling the request, otherwise uh, some the HMAC might be violated and might not be correct. An important property is, since we work on the header level um, and add a new header, we can still use cookie-based session management as a fallback. So is a, if a web server doesn't support the session me mechanism, the session header, um, he just sends back a cookie header and the browser, which still supports cookies, can still use the cookie-based session management. So um, we don't break any existing things. Also, for legacy applications where you don't uh, want to update the code or simply not able to update the code, um, which is basically half of the internet. You can use a server-side proxy that translates between cookie-based session management and the session header. So um, since this all happens at the server-side, the, the dangerous part where the, the data is transmitted is replaced by the new session management mechanism, and the old part, well, the, the internal server-side part still uses cookies, which are never exposed. So uh, that's, a, that's a good uh, uh, 
option for legacy applications. Two other scenarios where this, um, well, we have seen the third-party authentication provider scenario, but two other scenarios where this is really useful. The first one is the combination of HTTP and HTTPS. So this is actually very common on the web. Um, I've investigated a few sites how they deal with this, and um, many sites actually fail to provide this in a secure way. So the problem here is if you switch to HTTPS and then switch back to HTTP, um, your bearer token, which is your cookie for session management, becomes vulnerable. In, this, uh, in the case of secure session management, um, it become, does not become vulnerable because it's locked in the browser. So this is actually a good solution. Um, many sites suffer from this. Uh, I told you I investigated a few sites. Um, to give some examples, Amazon um, does it quite well. They have uh, a cookie for the HTTP part, a cookie for the HTTPS part. Um, so the HTTP part is the, the shopping itself, uh, browsing products, adding things to the cart that uh, can be hijacked. But whenever you switch to a, the, a sensitive operation like um, checking out or whatever, it switches to HTTPS and it requires the HTTPS cookie to be there. And if it's not there, so if you hijack the session, it's no longer there, um, Amazon kicks you out and you have to re-authenticate. So uh, they offer adequate protection. Facebook, on the other hand, does not unless you opt in for HTTPS, which is um, very optional and not many people use it. They also have HTTP and HTTPS cookies, but if you um, go to a sensitive operation without an HTTPS cookie, they, they happily comply, so uh, they, don't, they don't take care of this. I don't know if, whether it's a bug or intentional, uh, I didn't further investigate it. A second scenario uh, are HTTP-only applications. Um, of course, they are really, really vulnerable because they submit authentication information like credentials over plain text. Um, you would think like, who does this? But uh, I've seen it, so it happens. Um, so the problem here is we can protect our session management, but as long as you um, you transmit your credentials over over uh, plain text connection, then um, an eavesdropper can still uh, gain access. Additionally, if you have only HTTP applications, it's very difficult to protect against uh, active network attackers um, because they can do a man-in-the-middle attack. And if you're a man-in-the-middle, you can simply act as a server, accept everything, and uh, pass it along. And you're actually uh, sitting in the middle, which is exactly the problem that's solved by a TLS, which has entity authentication with the whole certificate management uh, and PKI infrastructure that uh, effectively protects against this kind of attack. We opted not to support this because um, what you're then doing is basically reinventing TLS, uh, which is, of course, um, a lot of wasted effort. Um, so if you deploy secure session management and you want additional protection like entity authentication and confidentiality and integrity, uh, you should uh, deploy TLS in one mode or another uh, in combination. Okay. Um, then I have some uh, related work, uh, which has uh, which has done in, in academia around this topic. So uh, first one is session lock. Um, I'll go over it very quickly, just to give you an idea of what else exists and what properties they have. So session lock basically works with a, a secret in the browser. It's uh, stored in JavaScript, so it's uh, very insecure against uh, cross-site scripting attacks, for instance. It uses AJAX to rewrite every request and include a secret token. Um, and the paper itself uh, states that it's, uh, it works well with simple applications, but once you have a very complex AJAX application, uh, things become really difficult and it's hard to support it. A second option is the HTTP integrity header. So they try to provide integrity uh, on HTTP, which would include protection for the, the cookie, uh, the session cookie as well. Um, they use uh, a secret key uh, fetched over TLS or with traditional DV Hellman. And their main, well, the main problem here is that they it takes a while if you have uh, the non-TLS option before you can start uh, protecting the, the integrity. So you have to uh, go back and forth to establish establish a shared secret, and only then you can protect uh, the resources. Um, a third one is better odd, uh, which is done by Martin Jones, uh, who is one of the organizers here. It's actually a, a good solution that uh, offers protection. It's based on uh, a key agreement uh, which uses the, the user's password to establish a share a key. The password is considered to be a shared secret, so the server knows it, the user knows it. So based on the user password, when you enter it, the browser generates a key and uses that for authentication instead of the password itself. So the password never uh, transfers uh, over the wire. Unfortunately, since it depends on the password, uh, it's incompatible in its current form, at least it's incompatible with third-party authentication. 
And it depends on HTTPS for the initial setup because you have to get the password at the server side, of course. And then the final one is uh, TLS origin bound certificates, which is actually uh, an extension to TLS. I believe it's being implemented in browsers uh, under the name channel ID. And what they basically do there is they um, automatically generate client certificates which are used in the TLS connection. So they get, they get strong authentication, authentication properties. And um, they also support the binding of tokens to the channel. So you can bind your uh, session cookie to the channel. And because of the strong authentication properties, you can guarantee that an attacker is not able to um, transfer the channel somewhere else. Uh, so we cannot transfer the, the tokens as well. So to conclude, um, in this talk, I have uh, presented our proposal for secure session management. It's, maybe it's not perfect. Uh, so if you have uh, input on that, I will be glad to hear it. But inherently, we try to fix the problem with session management, which, li which lies in the bearer token. So if you remove the bearer token from session management and replace it with something else, you automatically gain the properties you actually expect from a session management mechanism. Our mechanism is compatible with third-party authentication providers, which is uh, an important use case uh, in the web today. And uh, it's compatible with legacy applications or uh, browsers that don't support it. Um, so um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them now or uh, any time later. You can grab me here or send me an email if you want to. <laughs> Philip, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Dave. Okay. So the question was if you could implement this as uh, at the client side using JavaScript. Um, that's actually a very good question. I, if you have, if you possess the the right cryptographic APIs uh, to make signatures, I guess you could make a prototype using using the XHR object uh, to to show that it works. Yes. That's true. Of course, you cannot have protection against uh, cross-site scripting attackers. But as a prototype, yes, that would work, I guess. Further questions? Um, so the question is why we used uh, Diffie-Hellman instead of uh, automatically generating public-private keys. Um, it's actually, again, a good question. Um, I, I think the problem there would be if you generate a public-private key, how you know or how you, you transfer the keys, right? Yeah, that's something to check out whether that would be feasible or not. No, indeed, it's it's an option to check out. Thanks. And I have a question. Um, what about cross-site request forgery attacks against session management? Excuse me, can you repeat? Um, what about cross-site request forgery attacks uh, on the session management? Yeah. Um, that's actually a whole lot of problem um, because it's cross-site request forgery attacks don't don't steal the session identifier. They just uh, use the browser's um, feature that if you send a cross-domain request that he uh, adds authentication information, which is needed for a Facebook Connect or any any other cross-domain functionality. Honestly, I don't think session management can protect against that because the, the core of the problem is that you lack the user's intent of making a request. You don't know whether the browser makes it and it's intentional or whether an attacker injected it and it's an unintentional request. So you would have go to, go to a, a situation where you restrict the access paths within an application and can say that only through the right paths you can make a request. But I doubt that it's... It's a, s a thing that can be fixed from within session management, but... Yes, I think so. Uh, you have add additional security countermeasures against cross of yeah. Okay. Another question, yeah? 
Okay, so the question is why why don't uh, web server creators or uh, producers use HTTP only more often? Browser creators. Yeah, okay, so um, the correct question was why browser vendors don't uh, set the session cookies HTTP only by default um, and how many sites would break. Actually, we did uh, some research on that. Uh, well, my colleague there, Nick, uh, did Session Shield, which is a client side proxy that does exactly that. Um, and he used some heuristics to determine which cookies are session cookies and which are not. Uh, and I did, did that as co in combination with session fixation in uh, a browser add on called Serene. So, if you know which cookies are session cookies, then you could do it. So, I doubt that many sites would break, but the problem is that um, next to the predefined session cookies like PHP session ID, there are a lot of sites that use custom cookies, uh, with Facebook as a prime example, for instance. And using heuristics to determine the correct cookies is fairly difficult. You can do it up to some level, and then you have to start guessing, and then things start breaking. So, you, I, I guess you could do it for about 90, 95% of the sites. Um, but wh why they don't? Uh, well, browser vendors really don't like to break things. So, One example are Java plugins. Okay. Okay, thank you very much thank for you. your attention and thank you, Philip, for your talk.